In the modern laboratory, hydrogen, like oxygen, is usually obtained from a cylinder containing the gas under high pressure. The hydrogen in this cylinder, however, was probably obtained by the electrolysis of water or sodium chloride solution. On the screen, you see a picture of a small laboratory electrolyzer. The right-hand electrode, or the cathode, is where the hydrogen is being liberated. The left-hand electrode, or anode, is where the oxygen is being liberated. You can note that the hydrogen is being produced much more rapidly than the oxygen, actually just twice as fast. The liquid in this electrolyzer is water containing a small amount of sulfuric acid. We will now examine the two gases produced in the electrolysis uh, of the water, which has been going on in this apparatus. Uh, this tube contains the oxygen because it's been produced in just about half the quantity of the gas in this tube, the hydrogen. We've developed a test for oxygen before, the glowing splint test, and we'll apply it to the gas in this tube. Now invert a test tube over the delivery tip here, force the gas up into the tube, Light a splint in the burner, extinguish it, and the glowing splint test is obtained. So our suspicion that this gas is oxygen has been confirmed. Now the other gas should be hydrogen. We'll invert a tube over this delivery tip, and pour some hydrogen up into this test tube. Now hydrogen burns so we should expect a small pop when this gas is ignited. And that pop is obtained. In this experiment, then, we've demonstrated that the electric current will separate water into oxygen and hydrogen. And commercially, this reaction is carried out, and the hydrogen and oxygen are drawn off and bottled in cylinders for laboratory use. When metals are employed to displace hydrogen from one of its compounds, the rate of reaction depends on the activity of the metal and on the availability of replaceable hydrogen in the compound of hydrogen used as a source. Some metals are sufficiently active to displace hydrogen from water. In this beaker, we placed uh, some distilled water. And to this water, I'm going to add several drops of phenothaline solution. Phenothalin is an indicator which turns pinkish red in the presence of bases. In this bottle, we have some sodium. I've removed one piece of sodium from the bottle, dried off the kerosene, which is covering it, and placed the sodium on this watch glass. Now we'll drop the sodium into the beaker of water containing the phenothalin. You should notice that the reaction is very vigorous. The sodium has become so hot that it's melted. We have a little glob of molten sodium floating on the surface of the water. Hydrogen is being liberated rapidly. And sodium hydroxide is the other product of the reaction and is indicated by the pink color in the phenethalein solution. The reaction between sodium and water was too rapid and violent to be considered a good method for the laboratory preparation of hydrogen. Other metals react with water more slowly, however. In this bottle, we have metallic calcium. A small piece of this calcium is on the table. In the beaker, we have distilled water containing a few drops of phenothalene solution. I'll drop the calcium into the beaker and try to persuade it with the stirring rod to be trapped beneath the uh, bottom of the test tube. So that the gas that's produced is bubbling up into the test tube filled with water. You'll notice that the water in the beaker has assumed a pink color indicating the presence of a base. We'll collect approximately a half a test tube full of the gas and then establish its identity as hydrogen by igniting it. This should be a sufficient quantity of hydrogen. We'll knock the calcium from the bottom of the tube. 
Remove the tube from the beaker. Permit air to mix with the gas in the tube. Then apply the lighted splint test to this gas. The sharp bark indicates that when calcium reacts with water, the gas produced is hydrogen. And the other product of the reaction is calcium hydroxide, which causes the phenothalene to turn red. In these test tubes, I have placed samples of several different metals, zinc, iron, copper, aluminum, and magnesium. To each tube, I will add a few milliliters of dilute hydrochloric acid, since these metals do not react with water at an appreciable rate. Over each tube, I've inverted a larger test tube to collect any gas which might be given off by the reaction. We'll now wait for a few moments until a sample of gas has been collected from each reaction. We'll now test the gas produced by each reaction to see if it is hydrogen. This is the tube in which zinc is reacting with hydrochloric acid. Obviously, hydrogen is formed here. This is the tube in which iron is reacting. Hydrogen again. In the center tube, copper and hydrochloric acid are in contact, but no reaction is taking place, and no explosion is obtained. Copper does not replace hydrogen from hydrochloric acid. This is the tube in which the aluminum is reacting. Hydrogen. And this is the tube in which the magnesium has reacted. Hydrogen. Well, four of our five metals, then, have replaced hydrogen from hydrochloric acid, and only one, copper, has not replaced it. This is because copper is below hydrogen in the activity series, is less active than hydrogen, and cannot replace hydrogen from acid. On the board, you see the equations for several of the reactions uh, which we have just performed. The first equation shows the decomposition of water by means of an electric current to produce hydrogen and oxygen. The second equation shows the reaction of sodium, metal, with water. The third equation, the reaction of calcium with water to produce hydrogen and calcium hydroxide. Then four of the next five equations are very similar. These are the reactions of zinc and iron and aluminum and magnesium with hydrochloric acid to produce, in each case, a salt of the metal and hydrogen gas. And here we have the demonstration that copper metal does not react with hydrochloric acid and does not produce hydrogen. In the previous scene, we showed that the choice of a metal which will react with an acid uh, is important in the preparation of hydrogen. We will now illustrate that the choice of the acid is important also. In each of the test tubes, I placed a small portion of metallic zinc, granulated zinc metal. To the first tube, I'll add a small portion of hydrochloric acid dilute. This is the same reaction that we saw previously. Hydrogen is produced at a reasonable rate. To the second tube, I'll add some dilute sulfuric acid. Hydrogen is produced at a reasonable rate here also. To the third tube, I'll add some concentrated sulfuric acid. To the fourth tube, some dilute acetic acid. And to the fifth tube, some concentrated nitric acid. You should observe the difference in the reaction rate. The first two acids, dilute hydrochloric and dilute sulfuric, are satisfactory for the preparation of hydrogen from zinc because the reaction proceeds at a nice rate. Concentrated sulfuric acid is reacting with the zinc very slowly 
And if we examined the gas that is formed, we'd find that it was not hydrogen, but instead sulfur dioxide. Blue acetic acid and zinc will react to liberate hydrogen, but as you can see, the reaction is very slow because acetic acid is a weak acid and few hydrogen ions are available in the solution. Concentrated nitric acid reacted rapidly with zinc, but the product was not hydrogen. It was instead the brown gas, nitrogen dioxide. From a laboratory preparation standpoint, then, it would appear that dilute hydrochloric, dilute sulfuric acid would be good choices for the preparation of hydrogen, while the other three acids would not be good choices. In these two test tubes, I have placed pieces of mossy zinc and some distilled water. To one tube, we'll add a few drops of copper sulfate solution, which is, of course, blue. You'll notice that the zinc in this solution uh, darkens. This is because metallic copper is being plated out on the surface of the zinc. Now to each tube, we'll add a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid, which will, of course, be diluted by the water in the tubes. And you should notice the very considerable difference in the rate of the reaction of the acid with the zinc. There's a good reason for this. In this tube, the acid reacts with the zinc liberating hydrogen, but many thousands of little tiny bubbles of hydrogen stick to the surface of the zinc and prevent further reaction with the acid. The zinc in this tube, however, was copper plated, and hydrogen bubbles do not stick very effectively to copper. So in this case, the hydrogen immediately leaves the surface of the copper plated zinc, permitting more acid to penetrate to the zinc and causing a great increase in the rate of reaction. If we wish to use sulfuric acid and mossy zinc for the preparation of hydrogen, then, it's obvious that we should add a small quantity of copper sulfate in order to attain a better rate of reaction. We've now prepared a hydrogen generator using the principles that we've developed in preceding experiments. In this generator bottle, I've placed several pieces of mossy zinc. We then added some distilled water, some copper sulfate solution, and some concentrated sulfuric acid. The reaction is proceeding at a convenient rate. Hydrogen is being produced, and is bubbling into the water in the tank. Since this generator has been in operation for several minutes, all of the air has been flushed out of the system, and the gas that is now being produced is essentially pure hydrogen. We'll collect this uh, gas by displacement of water in the trough, indicating that its solubility in water is very low. Three bottles of gas will be collected in this fashion. To compare the density of hydrogen with the density of air, we will now open both of these bottles of hydrogen to the air. With this bottle, we will keep mouth down. In this bottle, we will turn mouth up on the table. We will now wait one minute and then attempt to light the gas in each bottle. One minute later, we will now apply the glowing splint test to the bottle which has been mouth up. And nothing happened. We'll now move to the bottle which has been mouthed down. We obtained an explosion indicating that plenty of hydrogen was still left in this bottle. This experiment indicates then that hydrogen is much less dense than air. To illustrate another property of hydrogen, we will take this last bottle of hydrogen gas and put it on top of a bottle of air. The two bottles mouth to mouth with the hydrogen on top, and will now permit the bottles to stay in this position for about three minutes. Three minutes later, the bottles remain in their original position. You will remember that the hydrogen was originally in the bottle on the top. Now, testing both of these bottles with the burning splint, but separately, we can obtain this result. An explosion from the top bottle, and an explosion from the bottom bottle. This means that considerable amount of hydrogen gas must have passed from the top bottle into the bottom bottle 
even though we saw before that hydrogen is lighter than air. This illustrates another property of gases in general, and hydrogen in particular, called diffusion. The molecules of gas are in such rapid motion, and the spaces between them are so great, that gas molecules mingle with each other quite readily. And as you saw in this experiment, quite a number of hydrogen molecules manage to penetrate down into the bottle of the heavier air. We return now to our hydrogen generator, which is operating as before with the zinc and sulfuric acid in the bottom of the bottle. I've wrapped a towel around the generator as a precaution in case of an explosion. The hydrogen is passing up this tube and through this calcium chloride tube, which we've inserted in the system, and which serves to pick up any spray or any water vapor in the hydrogen. And the dried hydrogen gas is now leaving the generator set up through this delivery tube. We will uh, now ignite the jet of hydrogen issuing from the end of the tube. The jet of hydrogen is now burning at the end of the tube. You may not be able to see the flame very clearly, but it's definitely there, as we can show by having it ignite this wooden splint. Now over this burning jet of hydrogen, I'm going to invert a clean, dry beaker. I want you to notice how the inside of the beaker becomes fogged with moisture. This, of course, is condensing water vapor, which has been formed as the hydrogen burns. We're now going to illustrate another chemical property of hydrogen, its activity as a reducing agent. In this test tube, we've placed a quantity of copper oxide, and through the tube, we're passing a stream of hydrogen. I'll now heat the tube at the higher temperature produced by the burner. The copper oxide and the hydrogen will react. The products of the reaction will be water and metallic copper. The copper, you can soon uh, tell is present by the uh, color of metallic copper, which will begin to appear in the tube. I think perhaps you can see some water vapor uh, condensing in the cooler portion of the tube. The metallic copper color is now appearing in the area in which we've been heating the copper oxide with the burner. Several times we tested for the presence of hydrogen by igniting a mixture of the gas and air. When hydrogen burns, this is the equation for the reaction, the product being water. And we saw in one experiment how this water, <clears throat> which is produced in the form of vapor, may be condensed on the inside of a cold beaker. The last experiment involved the reduction of copper oxide with hydrogen with the formation of copper and water. In this film, then, we've examined several different methods for the preparation of hydrogen. We've made a generator prepared several bottles full of the gas. We've examined its density relative to the density of air, and we've exhibited several features of its chemical behavior.